Hi everyone, this is the final lecture of the cardiovascular system. This material will be on the uh, test later this week. Um, so we're doing the five cardio lectures, not blood, and we're not doing um, the uh, anatomy of the blood vessels, like which blood vessels are which, like the radial artery and the ulnar artery and stuff. That will be on a subsequent lab practical. You'll have to know some things about the blood vessel structure, how they are, how they work. And you'll have to know the blood vessels of the heart, the coronary arteries, the aorta, the superior, inferior vena cava, that kind of stuff. But all stuff that is related to the heart rather than everywhere else. So this is the final lecture for this section. And it's covering blood pressure and electrocardiography. So this is uh, getting kind of medical, kind of doctorly. Um, tons of people suffer from blood pressure, high blood pressure these days. Um, obesity is a factor. Um, our bodies are extremely good and uh, de developed over the centuries of raising blood pressure when it gets too low. If people got stabbed, if they got bit by a tiger or something, it would bleed out and your blood pressure had to be sustained or you would die. People had to have good genetic ability to retain weight, retain fat, if you go in a period of famine, because nobody died from too much food up until recently. Everybody died from too little. So our systems are really good at things like keeping our blood pressure up, they're not good at keeping it down when it gets too high, and so we'll see how that plays out as we move along. Let's see what actually would affect blood pressure. More blood, okay, or if the cardiac output increases, if the heart rate or stroke volume gets bigger and you're pushing more blood into the aorta, your blood pressure is going to go up. We're measuring aortic blood pressure which is essentially the same as you find in your arm, the big arteries in your arm, and therefore you can measure it at your arm and use that to give you a good number for aortic blood pressure. So anything that increases cardiac output, CO or Q, so if heart rate stroke volume gets bigger in diastolic volume, meaning there's more blood to push, at the end of diastole you have more blood to push, a decrease in systolic volume means you've pushed out more of it because in systolic volume is at the end of the maximal squeeze when you, there's as little blood as possible in there. So if you squeeze harder, you push out more blood and therefore the blood pressure goes up. Um, central venous pressure, if the if, if venous pressure increases, that will push more blood to your heart and therefore increase cardiac output. TPR is total peripheral resistance. If you squeeze all of your arterioles at the same time and your heart is pushing the blood into the blood vessels, the blood vessel can't get out the other end, so your blood pressure goes up. So this is what happens if you get stressed or something and everything tightens up, too much sympathetic stimulation is squeezing the arterioles and they squeezing the precapillary sphincters and stuff, your heart is beating maybe even harder, and so your blood pressure goes up. And of course, if your blood volume increases, if you have more blood in the same blood vessels, your blood pressure goes up. So any of these factors, anything that increases cardiac output, increases the pressure at the outflow end, so resistance at the outflow end, so the pressure backs up, or an increase in blood volume, those things will cause your blood pressure to go up. So if you retain too much water, you get high blood pressure. That opposite is true. Anything that decreases cardiac output, so your heart rate, your stroke volume, less blood getting into the ventricle before it beats in diastolic volume, a decrease in TPR. So if you relax all of your blood vessels, your blood pressure will go down. Or if you lose blood. Okay, so in um, if, if, uh, in resistance at the arterioles, this is the TPR. Most people 
you haven't really run into total peripheral resistance. Now, if you squeeze just one little area of arterioles, the blood just goes somewhere else. But total peripheral means you're squeezing all of them at the same time, like you're really stressed out or you're scared or something. Then your blood pressure would go up. So here we have the flow going in. Um, the These uh, things on the top, if you increase flow, you're going to increase the mean arterial pressure or increase cardiac output. Um, total peripheral resistance, if it drops, would increase flow. In other words, if you open up the blood vessels wider, then flow can increase. Okay, the control of blood pressure is at rest, it's very, uh, it's a uh, mostly a central thing through your autonomic nervous system. You have ways to detect what your blood pressure is, and then you send out the right signal so you can either retain water, you can squeeze the blood vessels, you can speed up your heart rate, or whatever to bring it back up. If your blood pressure is too high, you can lower your heart rate, you relax your blood vessels, you pee more get rid of more fluid, and therefore your blood pressure goes back down. So it's a, a negative feedback mechanism that's constantly working to keep your blood pressure where it should be. Now, these things, all of these things are working all the time, but the easiest way to think about this is what would happen if I cut an artery and suddenly my blood pressure dropped? I would need to do something right now and then I would need to sustain that until I could make some more general changes. And then I would need to have a long-term effect to maintain it. So you have kind of short-term, medium-term, and long-term responses to changes in blood pressure. If your blood pressure suddenly went through the roof for some reason, these would all work in the opposite direction. But think about this from a point of view of suddenly losing blood pressure due to bleeding out or shock, where everything just relaxes. And what are you going to do to keep your blood pressure high enough that you don't die? Well, short-term regulation happens within seconds. Okay, it can happen immediate, and it will sustain it for maybe the first 30 minutes or so. So this is right away, you can do some things. Baroreceptors, these are pressure receptors that in your aortic arch, which we'll talk about later, they detect the drop in pressure and they send a signal to your brainstem to speed up your heart and squeeze your blood vessels. And it can happen within seconds. And it can maintain it for maybe 30 minutes or so. Chemoreceptors, they respond to changes in oxygen and carbon dioxide. So if your oxygen drops a whole lot or your CO2 goes way up, suddenly you would do the same thing. You'd send out messages to speed up the heart, or slow it down, or squeeze your blood vessels, or relax them right now, so that you can take care of the pressure changes and the oxygen changes within seconds. Intermediate regulation will happen because the local tissues then will respond to these changes in pressures and oxygen levels and buildup of metabolic wastes and stuff by producing local vasodilators to let more blood go there. If they don't have enough oxygen, they dilate and let more blood go through that area so they get more oxygen. This takes a little while. It doesn't happen instantly. But, you know, before this effect runs out, this is kicking in and it can last for a few hours. And during that time, it gives you time to start retaining water. So you have more blood. Now, if you bled out, that's exactly what you want to do. You want to retain water and build up your blood volume again. If you had shock and all of your blood vessels just relaxed too much and you fainted because of that, you know, that's kind of what shock is. That just means everything, your heart suddenly slows and your blood vessels all relax. All of your blood falls to your feet and you pass out. So, you know, you would immediately try to squeeze your blood vessels and speed up your heart rate. You would produce losal vasoconstrictors, in this case, that would allow 
um, uh, uh, your pressure to go from being too low to being a little bit higher. And long-term regulation, you'd start retaining water to make sure that you had enough blood volume to fill this new larger volume of blood vessels that all relaxed. Now, this is not this isn't a good long-term solution for shock because if you retain too much water, it can cause problems too. But you got to live now. You got to live first, and then you can try to solve the problem that caused the shock in the first place or whatever. So immediate sympathetic stimulation causing your heart to speed up and squeezing, that happens right away. Local vasodilators or constrictors, I should say on there, vasodilators or constrictors to regulate from a local level. And then over the long term, you retain enough water to fill up that, that blood deficit and build up your blood pressure again. And meanwhile, your bone marrow is rapidly making erythrocytes to turn that water into blood instead of just water. Now, we've, you probably have seen this before. You probably should have anyway. But this is um, the main mechanism for that water retaining thing. You know, it's your primary mechanism for retaining the right amount of fluid so that if, you're, if you don't have enough blood pressure, if you don't have enough blood, you retain more water at the kidneys. And if you have too much, you pee more and you get rid of some of it. This is the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. It starts at the kidneys. The kidneys have the ability to detect blood pressure changes. If your blood pressure drops, the kidneys are signaled to make a hormone called renin. Renin takes a product that is floating around in your blood all the time called angiotensinogen, means it's, it generates angiotensin. Renin converts this into angiotensin 1. Then you have a, an enzyme mostly found in your lung tissue, interestingly, called angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE. ACE will convert ANG1 to ANG2. ANG2 is the effector. This is what really works. Angiotensin 1 doesn't really do anything. Renin doesn't do anything. This is a cascade to make this stuff. Angiotensin 2 causes vasoconstriction immediately. Well, in that kind of mid-range time, it takes a, a little while to make enough of this. It's a vasoconstrictor. So it'll start causing some vasoconstriction and cause your blood pressure to go up, increasing total peripheral resistance because it's in your blood, so it's going everywhere. Angiotensin II also signals your kidneys to make aldosterone. This is another hormone that causes your kidneys to retain sodium. You use sodium potassium pumps to pump more sodium back into your blood instead of peeing it out. More sodium goes back into your blood. It draws water by osmosis, and so you pee less. Instead of the water staying in the urine, it gets pulled back into your blood and you retain water. The renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system is designed to raise your blood pressure when it gets too low. You make renin, you can make angiotensin 1, which converts by ACE into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 then causes vasoconstriction and water retention through aldosterone. Aldosterone, water retention, and, and uh, sodium, the water follows the sodium, your blood volume goes up, and then your arterial pressure goes back up again. You're in an angiotensin aldosterone system. Hugely important system. If you have high blood pressure, people will take ACE inhibitors. An ACE inhibitor keeps you from converting ANG1 to ANG2. And so you don't do this stuff and you don't raise your blood pressure as much. Angiotensin II has all kinds of effects. It doesn't just, I mean, it causes you to retain water in the kidneys through aldosterone. 
sodium and water retention, causes your pituitary to produce what's called antidiuretic hormone, which we'll see more about in the um, hormone part of the course, which comes up next. It makes you thirsty, so you drink more water. You can't retain more water if you don't drink it in the first place, so it increases your thirst. It causes your cardiac muscle to hypertrophy so that you can squeeze harder and raise your blood pressure. So all of these things, and it just causes vasoconstriction by itself too. So all of these things, once the kidney makes renin, takes angiotensin to ACE1, ACE converts it to ANG2, and then angiotensin 2 causes all of these effects which raise your blood pressure. Now you have another uh, hormone that counters this. This is called atrial natriuretic peptide. When you have high pressure in the right atrium, it says pressure is too high, it reduces ANP, atrial natriuretic peptide. You know, diuretic means you get rid of water, natriuretic means you get rid of sodium. You get rid of sodium, you get rid of water. So this counters the effects of aldosterone. All right, aldosterone makes you retain sodium and thus water. This makes you pee out more sodium and thus water. And therefore, you pee more. You know, you get rid of sodium and water and your blood volume goes down. So your blood pressure goes back down. Okay, so that's the whole point. The trouble is, as I said, our systems are way better at raising blood pressure than lowering it. So ANP is a weenie compared to aldosterone. The renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system is much more powerful than this system. This is just more of a fine tuner. When you have pretty much normal blood pressure, this will help you keep it fine tuned. But it doesn't really help that much if you really have high blood pressure. Let's look at the baroreceptors. Baro means pressure, like a barometer is a pressure meter, tells you about the atmospheric pressure. Baroreceptors are pressure sensors, and they are in two places that you really want to know where your blood pressure is, how it's doing. That's the aortic arch, and in the carotid sinus here, where the, the internal carotid arteries go into your brain. External carotids go to your scalp or the outside of your head. Internal carotids go to the inside of your brain. These are you really care where your blood pressure is leaving the heart and entering the brain. So you have pressure receptors. These will sense the pressure changes and send signals back to the brain stem. Not your thought part of your brain, but the brain stem, the medulla oblongata and parts of the pons and things, but mainly the medulla oblongata. And it will send out the right signals to the heart and blood vessels to correct the change in blood pressure. If your blood pressure goes up, these guys sense it and they fire fast. High pressure, high firing rate. High pressure, high firing rate. That tells your brain stem that the pressure has gone up. The brain stem then sends out the right signals through the vagus nerves, to the heart, to slow it down, to the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems to relax your blood vessels so that your blood pressure can normalize. Once it normalizes, the firing rate drops back down to normal and you stop the system. It's a negative feedback mechanism. So here we have, there's the carotid sinus and the aortic arch and we're sending the signals to the brain stem and it's sending out the either parasympathetic signals to the to the SA node to slow the heart round uh, down is sending out you know, more parasympathetics to the body in general and less sympathetics, and the blood vessels relax and dilate. The heart slows down. Your blood pressure goes back down. If the blood pressure drops too low, the baroreceptors fire much slower. The brainstem is told there's not enough blood pressure, and so they will send out more sympathetics. So it's a matter of 
more sympathetic, less parasympathetic, or the other way around, depending on whether you need the pressure to go up or down. So, if blood pressure goes up, what happens here? They fire more. Okay? More blood pressure, they fire like mad, they tell the cardiovascular center to add parasympathetic, that'll slow your heart rate, and take off sympathetic, so again, the heart rate can slow, the heart rate doesn't beat as hard, your total peripheral resistance goes down because you relax your blood vessels, and it brings the blood pressure back down to normal. In the opposite direction, if the blood pressure is dropped too much, the baroreceptor refiring drops way down, okay, we're telling the CNS there's not enough blood pressure, therefore you would increase sympathetic, decrease parasympathetic, and bring it back up. And it can happen within seconds. And it maintains for maybe 30 minutes or so. The problem is that this baroreceptor response is good at detecting and correcting changes. It doesn't detect chronic high blood pressure and do anything about it. Once your blood pressure is here, the baroreceptors get used to that as being the new normal, and they go back to firing normally. They'll fire again if it goes up more, but once it's going up that more, they'll fire for a while. You'll do the best you can to lower it, but if it stays up there, they just relax and go back to firing normally again. So they're good at acute changes. They're good for that short term, seconds to within 30 minutes or so of having much effect, and then fully reset after a day or two, okay? But the best response is that immediate response in the next few minutes. So that's, uh, th there we have you know, the baroreceptor short-term, we have angiotensin II and, and other vasodilators and constrictors for, for the mid-immediate time, and then the angiotensin renin-aldosterone system to cause you to retain water at the kidneys is your long-term effect. And that really doesn't kick in much until about a day. So these short and medium-term things have to keep you alive until you can retain enough water starting after about a day after the event um, to help correct it. So here, now we have the CNS ischemic response. <clears throat> and this is um, your, your central nervous system, your brain stem, is especially sensitive. I mean, it doesn't like it when your blood pressure drops in general. You know, it'll, you know, get stimulated and it'll help correct it. But it really doesn't like it if its own oxygen level drops. If you have a loss of blood flow to the brain stem, part of your brain now, it's inside your skull, you'll get a huge sympathetic uh, stimulation that will cause an increase in blood pressure. It'll go up to like 250 millimeters of mercury from your 120 over 70 trying to push blood into your brain to keep you from dying. It's a last-ditch effort. It also adds a lot of pressure to your brain, which can kill you. But, you know, again, you have to stay alive for this minute, at least, and then the next minute. And if it kills you an hour from now, at least, at least you had a chance for this minute and the next minute to do something to try to survive. So... Cushing, a CNS ischemic response, is if something happens to drop your blood pressure so low that the, the pressure doesn't go through the brain stem, then the CNS ischemic response pushes your blood pressure way up for 10 minutes or so to try to keep you alive. The Cushing reaction, named after the person who discovered not only this happens if your heart slows down, but it happens if something inside your skull blocks the blood flow, okay? So, kid falls off a skateboard without a helmet, bashes his head, the brain starts to swell and you get some pressure in there and now the blood can't go through the arteries into the brain. 
it stops moving or slows down in the brainstem, the brainstem initiates this CNS ischemic response. And your heart may be beating just fine. You may, your blood pressure may be okay, but there's not blood flowing through the brainstem. And so your blood pressure goes through the roof, trying to push blood into your head. And this becomes, you know, it tries to keep the kid alive right now, but it'll kill the kid if it's not corrected because high pressure inside the brain winds up damaging the brain and blocking other blood flow and all that kind of stuff. But the Cushing reaction is a CNS ischemic response caused by some damage inside the skull that is preventing blood from moving through the brainstem. Valsalva maneuver. This is where they always tell you, don't hold your breath when you lift weights. Okay? Don't go like this. You're supposed to go when you lift weights, right? Because holding your breath and pushing like that creates big pressures inside your thorax and inside your head and can do damage, but it can also cause you to pass out if, you, if you're not careful. If you do a Valsalva maneuver, which is where you close off your airways and squeeze, your blood pressure goes way up because you're squashing it. And as a result, your baroreceptors tell your heart to slow way down and all of your blood vessels to dilate. As soon as you relax, your blood vessels are dilated, your heart is slow, and all your blood falls into your feet and you pass out. Now, we used to do this as kids, you know. We didn't know anything about drugs, so, you know, it wasn't even a chance to abuse anything when I was a kid. But one thing that we could do is people would kind of hyperventilate, and then they'd hold their breath, and somebody would grab you around the middle and hold, and then suddenly relax, and you'd faint. And it was kind of a rush. It was kind of, you know, horribly, terribly bad for us to do it. But we didn't have any other bad things to do, so... You know, we thought it was great. But the other thing that uh, happens, especially in older people, I talked to some EMTs who said that a fair percentage of their calls are from an elderly person who is trying to have a bowel movement and they're constipated because they're old. They push really hard and then they relax a second and they faint and fall off and break their shoulder. It's actually a fairly serious problem that can happen to older people. They're doing the Valsalva, and their heart rate slows way down, their blood vessels dilate, and then when they relax a second, their blood pressure drops. Their blood pressure drops, and they pass out. Okay, so enough about blood pressure. Any questions you have on that, you can put in your discussion session this week. Let's talk a little bit about electrocardiography. Um, I love to teach a whole course in this because it's so interesting. It's really puzzle-solving stuff. But electrocardiography has been around a long time. It's called either ECG, because we spell cardio with a C, EKG, because it was invented in Europe where they spelled cardio with a K. EKG, ECG, same thing, electrocardiography. What they discovered was that your heart, you know, you, the SA node fires, and you send the signal around it through the atria, it reaches the AV node, it hesitates a second, it fires and sends the signal down the bundle of hiss and uh, uh, bundle branches and all, down into the ventricles, and they fire, and when they fire, all the ions flow through those cells from cell to cell to cell to cell to cell through the gap junctions. And therefore, you start out here, and you get a firing, some ion flow, another firing, some more ion flow. And it's similar enough in each heart that you can put electrodes on and measure that ion flow and say, okay, those ions are flowing normally, and therefore this heart is working normally. 
And anytime something goes wrong with the heart, some of the ions will go off in the wrong direction and you can see it on your EKG. And it's when you get really good at it, it's really fun. You can detect a lot of things by changes in the ECG. So here is a typical ECG tracing, okay? And let's let's go back a second because what you do is you put electrodes on the on the body. You can put them on the wrists and ankles, which is where they did it first, or you can bring them into the torso so you can brush your teeth without causing the machine to go crazy. So you put the them here, and if the ions are flowing toward an electrode, it's set up so that it pushes its little needle up. If they're flowing away from an electrode, it pushes the needle down. So you can tell if ions are going toward this picture, toward this electrode, you can tell if they're going away from this one. And so that's how you tell the direction and how much. If a lot more ions go, it pushes the needle farther. Okay, so you know the direction is going by which electrode it's headed toward. And you also know how many ions are going by how tall the thing gets. All right, so here we have what's called the isoelectric line. Along here, this is when the heart isn't doing anything. Okay, this is between beats here. Now, the first thing happened is the SA node fires and some ions flow through the atria. Not much meat there. It's a fairly small amount of ions. But if it's flowing toward the electrode we're looking at, which it is on this one, it pushes the needle up a little bit. Then you hesitate for a tenth of a second to let the blood go down in the ventricles. Then the AV node fires, the bundle of his, the bundle branches, the Purkinje fibers, and then all the ventricular cells fire, and that's your big spike because there's a lot more meat. Then you wait a little bit after that, and then you repolarize so that you can start over again. The T wave is the repolarization of the ventricles where, you know, the first thing is you get a lot of sodium rushing in. The next thing you got a lot of potassium rushing out. The sodium rushing in does this and the potassium rushing out does this. Okay. And so we have our atrial depolarization, ventricular depolarization, ventricular repolarization. Those are your main things here. The first, the P wave, is this is called the P wave, atrial. Now they could have called this the A, B, C, D, E wave, waves, but we use A, B, C, D, E for everything else, so they just decided to start toward the end of the alphabet, and so the P wave is atrial depolarization. The R wave is ventricular depolarization, and you have a couple of waves where if part of the ions go in the opposite direction, they don't always, but sometimes they do, depending on where you're looking from. If it goes down before it goes up, that first down reflection is a Q wave. And if it goes down afterward, it's an S wave. So this is called the QRS complex. The QRS complex, which the main wave is your R wave. But if you have some things, like if you have a really big Q wave, it only does that if you've had a heart attack. So you can look at some stuff like this. P is atrial depolarization. The QRS, especially the R wave, are all the stuff that goes on when the ventricles fire. And then the T wave is ventricular repolarization. There's another point here that's really important. This is called the ST segment. It's the flat space between the S and the T. It's supposed to be even with the rest of the isoelectric line, more or less. If it's way up here, there's a problem. If it's way down here, there's a problem. They can tell you're having a heart attack right now if it changes too much. So remember the P, Q, R, S, and T, and then the ST segment. There's a lot more we could do in a course, but this is like 30 minutes of EKG to give you some of the real basics. Okay, so here's the P wave. 
The PR interval is supposed to be a certain width. If it's too short, there's a problem. If it's too long, there's a problem. The QRS, see the ones I have highlighted? The QRS is ventricular depolarization. It should also be pretty skinny and straight. If it's really wide, it's taking too long, so that's a problem. But you won't have to know these numbers for this course. But you do have to know what that P wave is, the QRS is and that it should be skinny. The ST segment between the QRS and the T, that's where you would indicate you're having a heart attack if it goes up too high. <coughs> Ischemia if it's going too low. I'll show you those later. And the T wave is ventricular repolarization. So here's a normal EKG. And there's a ton of stuff you can tell from this. But for your first day in the hospital, the first day in your nursing program, the first day, what you ought to be able to do is look at an EKG and say, well, that looks about right. Okay, you're not an EKG expert yet. But you can say, look, every, every one of these times there's a P, a QRS. This one just has an R wave. It doesn't have any Q and S. That's okay. You're going to have the R. You may have a Q, you may have an S. It's got an ST segment and a T wave. P, Q, R, S, T. P, Q, R, S, T. There's a P, Q, R, S, T every time. There's not an extra P wave. There's not a missing wave. There's a P, Q, R, S, T every time. P, Q, R, S, T every time. They look about the same every time. One isn't a huge different shape or something. You have a PQRST every time that looks about the same every time. That's a really good start. It means every time the atri is firing, it's going down the right way, it's repolarizing when it should, and everything is cool. You look to see the isoelectric line. See if the ST segment is way up here or way down there. If it's not, that's a good thing. That means there's no heart attack or ischemia going on. ST segments about right. Look at the and the uh, look at the RR intervals. That is the time between here and here, here and here, here and here. From the top of the R to the top of the R, it should be about the same distance every time. It's going to change a little bit. Your heart isn't a machine. But it shouldn't be going really fast and really slow and really fast and really slow. The RR intervals are about the same, are pretty consistent. Okay? If you have a PQRST every time that looks about the same every time, and nothing is huge and wide and weird looking, the ST segment is about where it should be, and the RR intervals are about the same, then you have what is called sinus rhythm. It means it's starting at the sinus atrial node, sinoatrial node, the sinus uh, node, and going through the proper pathway. So you have sinus rhythm. Heart rate, sinus rhythm. Okay, starting this A node, there's a PQRST every time, and they're the right length. Okay, this is more, don't, you don't need to know the numbers here. Okay, is the isoelectric line level. That means is the ST segment the same as it was. And then you have to look to see what the heart rate is. Because you can have sinus rhythm that is really slow, because there's a PQRST every time that looks about the same every time, and ST segment's right, and all that. But the heart rate is real slow. You can also have a sinus rhythm that's really fast, or you can have one that is a more or less normal resting heart rate, which is between 60 and 100 beats a minute. A normal rate is between 60 and 100 beats a minute. If it's slower than 60, it's bradycardia. If it's over 100, it's tachycardia. Now, bradycardia is situational. A lot of athletes have slower heart rates than 60. When I was training for the U.S. Open, my heart resting heart rate was 48. Okay, it's, it can be really slow, but it was because I was real healthy and real skinny. My heart didn't have to work very hard. Okay, 
Now my resting heart rate is more like 66, you know, it's more like a resting heart rate for a, a normal healthy guy my age. But, you know, if, if I have sinus rhythm and I have a normal rate, then I have normal sinus rhythm, 60 to 100. If it's a little slow, it is sinus bradycardia. If it's a little fast, it's sinus tachycardia. Now, when would sinus tachycardia be normal? Hey, I just went for a run. My heart rate's 120. I am in sinus tachycardia. It's supposed to go fast when you run. But if I've been sitting watching TV for an hour and my heart rate's 120, that's a bad version of sinus tachycardia. That's, it shouldn't be that way. So it's a little bit situational. Normal sinus rhythm. Sinus bradycardia is sinus rhythm that's slow. Sinus tachycardia is sinus rhythm that's fast. Okay, so how do you tell what the heart rate is? Well, for one thing, if you're looking at an EKG machine, a lot of times it'll tell you. But if you just get a strip and you're supposed to evaluate the EKG strip, you got to figure it out for yourself. And when we have our labs with everybody's in there, we all prep each other. We run we have heart, you know, EKGs on each other. We evaluate the strips and all that. Well, we don't get to do that this time. I am going to have a... Um, a demonstration lab for you with heart rate and blood pressure and EKG and you'll get to see how it's done and if you happen to be able to borrow a stethoscope and stuff you can do it at home and if you want to go online and look at some more EKG strips and calculate the heart rates and stuff there's tons of that stuff online but right now I'm going to teach you what you need to know to pay, get the question right on the test and also just to give of some basic understanding as to how this works. So, the option, there are a couple of options. This one takes some memorizing and you learn, you know, if if it's two big squares apart, it's, if you've got a heart rate of this or whatever. So that's a good way to learn so you can just glance at an EKG and tell what it is without having a calculator. But I'm not going to make you learn that. I'm going to make you learn the more the most precise um, way of calculating heart rate, and the one that I'll have you do on the on the uh, test. And that is, you take your calculator and you type in fifteen hundred, and that divided by fifteen hundred, and then you hit divided by. And then you count the number of tiny squares between two beats. And you say 1,500 divided by 30. Let's say there are 30 little squares. And you say, okay, 1,500 divided by 30. You know, and you hit enter, and it gives you your answer. So let's look at this. Here we have, let's look at this top one. Now, the easiest way to count all these little tiny squares, because I could go from here, I could go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, or each of the large squares contains five little squares in it. So from here, I can go 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. 1,500 divided by 30. You go, and don't do it backwards, do 1,500 first divided by 30, now that's one that you can do in your head, is 50, right? 1,500 divided by 30 is 50. Would that be a normal rate, tachycardia or bradycardia? Well, it would be bradycardia. It would be bradycardia. Let's look at this one. That one looks like it's going pretty fast. This one has, uh, has some other problems, too. I don't see a PQRS. I don't see a P wave. You know, uh, Okay, these have some other problems. But we're just looking at the heart rate here. Do this one real quick. Quick. 1,500 divided by 10 is what? 150. Okay? So the heart rate's 150. So this is tachycardia. Is it sinus tachycardia? No. I don't see a P, Q, R, S, T every time. It looks about the, the ST segment looks screwed up. 
You know, I wouldn't call this sinus tachycardia, but it's certainly tachycardia because it's over 100. What about this one? This one looks a little bit more normal. There's a PQRST, 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 PQRST. They look about the same every time. There's a little bit of what's called wandering baseline as the whole thing goes up and down a little bit. Ignore that. That's usually just because your electrode wires are moving around a little bit. There's a PQRST every time. It looks about the same every time. The ST segment's right in line with everything else. You know, it's pretty much the same. The RR intervals are pretty regular. Okay, so this is a sinus rhythm. What's the rate? Well, if I can find one of these guys that falls on a black line, then I can go 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 26. Okay, what is 1,500 divided by 26? It's about 57 or 58. Okay, so what would this be called? Would it be normal sinus rhythm? No, because it's below 60. It is sinus rhythm, but it is sinus bradycardia. In fact, this is a heart rate of a trained athlete. It has a heart rate, resting heart rate of 58, a little bit below 60. It's fine for him. Now, this is a different problem. You've heard of atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation, there is no consistent beat going from up top. So you'll have a longer space, a shorter space, an even shorter space, an even longer space, an even longer space, so that it's going like this. So there's a different way of calculating an average heart rate for that. I won't have you do that for this class. What I will give you is one that has consistent RR intervals, R, 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 and you go 1,500 divided by the number of small squares that are in there. Okay, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 26 or so. 20, it depends. This one's 26. This is closer to 25. It's going to be real close. And the number I give you on your multiple choice question will be, there will only be one that's close. I will say this a patient's heart rate is closest to, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, whatever, you know, and you would figure it out, and it would be close to one of them, and so that would be your answer. I'm going to teach you one conduction defect. It's the easiest one to spot, and it makes you look like you know what you're talking about. If, <coughs> if you pick out one, I had students who had the visiting doctors come in, and, and the student, they were we were doing the EKG class, and one of my students said, oh, that looks like a right bumble branch block, you know, and the doctor, oh, oh yeah, you, you know your stuff, you know, so it was good. Think about this. We have the P, then we have the, the ions going through the ventricles, and they all go through pretty much at once, so you get this one spike. Well, what if you have these two bundle branches going down from the bundle of Hiss, and they're taking the signal down into the two ventricles, out the Purkinje fibers. But one of them is blocked, either from a genetic defect or from a heart um, infection or from a heart attack or something that caused a damage to one of those bundles. Your cells are still connected together, so your heart will beat even if the signal stops in one of them and goes down the other one. But it'll go through its side efficiently, and then they'll make it across to the other side. So the signal comes down, and then it goes shoom, boom. So you get one side and then the other side, not exactly at the same time. The ventricles will beat slightly separately, and you get a double spike. Instead of having one spike where it all happens at the same time, you get a double spike. We call it rabbit ears. Rabbit ears. So you have two vertical spikes. These are two R waves. This is called R and R prime. Here's another version of it. R, R prime. Okay, 
anytime you have, and it usually makes it really wide because it takes longer for all of that to happen. So if you have a wide QRS and it's got two vertical spikes, it is a bundle branch block. Now, how can you tell if it's a right bundle branch block or a left bundle branch block? If the rabbit ears are on the right side of your heart, it's a right bundle branch block. If the rabbit ears are on the left side of your heart, it's a left bundle branch block. And remember, rabbits don't stand on their head. This is not ears pointing down. These are ears pointing up. Up. It points up. Two spikes going up. And the trouble is, they're not always even. They can be really uneven and make it a little harder to find. But here we have a right bundle branch block because this is on the right side of the heart. This, the rabbit, is on the left side of the heart. How do you know the right from the left? Well, here we have the way you prep uh, an ECG. And we'll, we'll do that in the lab. I'll, I'll show you very, very clearly how to do it in the lab. But you put on what are called the limb electrodes the right arm and left arm, the right leg and left leg. And then you put your chest leads across, or precordial leads, go across the front and side of your heart, starting on the right, moving to the left. Right is number one, left is number six. You have V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, right first, left second, right first, left second. People get this backwards on the test. If it shows up in V1, 2, or 3, it's on the right. If it's 4, 5, and 6, it's on the left. 1, 2, 3, right, 4, 5, 6, left. So you look for where the rabbit ears are and determine whether it's on the right or left side. So here we have a 12-lead EKG. You get 12 different views. <coughs> well, it looks like rabbit ears. But where did I just tell you to look? In the chest leads. V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Am I seeing two vertical spikes on the right side? No. Do I see two vertical spikes on the left side? Yes. Yes. Yes, left bundle branch block. It's wide, and it has two vertical spikes. If the rabbit ears are on V1 or V2 or V3, it's a right bundle branch block. Remember that. Look for, look for rabbit ears. Look for spikes, if, especially if you have kind of an odd-looking uh, EKG, and it's got two spikes sticking up, Look to see if it's 1, 2, 3 for right, 4, 5, 6 for left. And the other part of this is detecting heart attacks. Okay? We just talked about the electrical problems of your heart, but now we're talking about the plumbing. If you block a coronary artery, the blood can't get through, and part of that heart muscle dies. That's a heart attack, a myocardial infarction. If it just starves for air for a while and hurts, it's called myocardial ischemia. Ischemia means you're not getting enough blood and not, not enough oxygen, but the cells haven't died yet. They can malfunction, they can hurt, your heart can beat poorly, but you're not having a heart attack until cells start dying. Okay, coronary artery disease. It kills more people than anything else, except COVID now is killing more people than coronary artery disease in the whole world. Um, but it, it does include both men and women. Um, they used to think men died of heart attacks and women died of natural causes because women were protected for an extra 10 years. Nobody seemed to live about at past the age of 70 or 75 in those days. And so if a woman died at age 73, she died of natural causes. But if the man died at 60, he died of a heart attack. 
And the signs and symptoms aren't exactly the same either. But as it turns out, that once you reach about the age of 70, the likelihood of getting a heart attack completely balances out because the women, the men have lived past the point where they would have had an early heart attack and the women no longer have protection from estrogens that being 20 years after menopause, and so they catch up and the risk factors are about the same. Furthermore, more sedentary behaviors. We sit at the computer instead of going out and running around all the time. Hypokinetic disease, they call it. I love that. Lack of movement disease. A study done is almost 20 years ago now, saying it found that that 10% of kids between the age of 5 and 10 already had a cardio disease risk factor, either related to diabetes, high blood pressure, or obesity. And if the kid was obese, a, a significant number already had two, which put them at elevated risk for a heart attack by the time they were 10. So, you are facing, in your medical careers, a population that is not doing great when it comes to heart stuff. We have a lot of ways to fix broken hearts, but we're not that, haven't done a great job at preventing heart disease because people eat poorly, they eat you know, fast food, and they sit in front of their computer all the time studying for, you know, like A&P2 tests and stuff. So, kills more people than any other disease, except now, right now, COVID. Um, increasing heart disease with sedentary behaviors, and most of it involves the blockage of your coronary arteries. We remember the left main, left anterior descending, left interventricular, the left circumflex going around the side, and the right coronary artery going down around the back. You know, we've seen some of our coronary arteries. You block, get a, a plaque built up in here and it narrows the lumen of the vessel. If it gets less than about 50% of capacity, it'll start blocking blood flow to the downstream tissues. And if you get a little blood clot that would have passed through in the olden days, it will now get stuck in that plaque and cause an immediate and acute myocardial infarction like happening right now. Here we have the coronary plaque, atherosclerosis it's called, and it doesn't actually stick to the inside of the blood vessel wall. What happens is you get an inflammation of the coronary artery, <coughs> largely caused by damage due to um, high blood pressure, it can be caused by damage due to toxins in your environment or in your food. Um, high cholesterol levels cause an oxidative damage to blood vessel walls. Um, a variety of other things. A cigarette smoking causes a lot of damage to blood vessel walls. So your, your cavalry comes in, your white blood cells coming in because in, inflammation, they think it's an infection. The monocytes penetrate. They go in here looking for somebody to eat. There's nobody to eat because there's no infection there. So they die and leave their blob of goo that they bring with them to repair cells with behind. They carry a lot of cholesterol with them. And you build up a cholesterol-rich plaque along the coronary artery. It ultimately builds up so big that it can rupture and form its own blood clot which can then block off your coronary artery and kill you. Inflammation is what starts it. Inflammation. And that starts a lot of our diseases in our body. Is a, is a, a response to damage or even suspected problems by your immune system that cause inflammation. That inflammation causes these uh, monocytes to come in and die and leave behind, they call them foam cells because they're so big and full of cholesterol when they come in here, they look like little soap bubbles. When they die, they leave the fat deposits behind and it's under the endothelium. 
And if it gets big enough, it can cause it to rupture and cause blood clots to form out in here that can kill you the rest of the way. So how do you tell on an EKG if you have heart disease? Well, if your heart still has enough blood supply, even during exercise, you can't tell. One of the best ways to tell is if you exercise and you get heart pain. That's one of the biggest indicators that you have heart disease. If you get chest pain during exercise, then you're very likely to have some level of heart disease. The next thing is that your heart may get plenty of blood during rest, but during exercise it needs five times as much blood. Those narrow arteries can't give that extra blood, and so you have what's called myocardial ischemia. It's mostly in the endocardium. Remember that inside layer? It gets smashed by the outside layer every time your heart beats and it squashes the blood vessels inside the endocardium. And therefore, they are the first to start starving for oxygen if those vessels are partially blocked. So this myocardial ischemia often is called subendocardial ischemia beneath the endocardium, that first inner layer. And it is the indication on the EKG is ST segment depression. Here we have the P. The QRS, whoa, look, the ST segment is way down here. This was a real patient that I had in a cardiac rehab place I was working for a while, usually accompanied by chest pain, but not always. But this person has ischemia, ST segment depression. Their EKG, their, their uh, QRS is fine. They don't have a bundle branch block causing strangeness or anything. This is fine. What's the only change is this ST segment depression indicates ischemia. Cells aren't dying yet. They're just choking. ST segment elevation. Look, here's the ST segment. This one looks pretty good. Here we have the R wave and the ST segment all the way out to the T wave here is elevated. ST segment elevation. ST segment elevation means you're having a heart attack right now. It means that's an acute heart attack, an acute MI, acute myocardial infarction is going on if you have ST segment elevation. See, look at your P. Here's your QRS. Ooh, wow, the ST segment is elevated. It's above the rest of the isoelectric line. Ischemia, ST segment is low. MI, heart attack, it's high. So, you know how to look basically at a, a tracing and say that's normal sinus rhythm or sinus tachycardia or sinus bradycardia or maybe it's not a sinus rhythm at all if it has if the if it's going really fast really slow really fast or if the st segment is screwed up or if it's missing p waves or something like that then it can be it can be tachycardia or bradycardia but it's not a sinus rhythm if it doesn't have p q r s t every time look about the same every time da 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 so you can tell if somebody has sinus rhythm. You can tell if it's sinus tachycardia, normal sinus rhythm, or sinus bradycardia by heart rate. You can identify rabbit ears, bundle branch block on the right side, one, two, three, or the left side, four, five, six. You can identify subendocardial ischemia with ST segment depression. And, and a heart attack, myocardial infarction, cur uh, current happening at this moment with ST segment elevation. So in a relatively short spiel on EKG, I think you know what it is and how to use it. Hopefully, you'll get some further instruction on EKG over your careers and will get pretty good at it because it's 
like I say, it's a lot of fun. Here is the prep and placement slide. And I'm going to show you this on the lab. We're going to have, and that will be after this first lab. Right? This first lab is going to cover the, uh, the um, heart parts and the labs that we already did. Um, the, this first lecture test will cover the, the, the five lectures, but not electrode placement. This is so you have it handy because when we do the lab um, uh, next week after the test, after the test, um, not this week that we're just getting ready to go into, but the, the next one, we're going to be learning how to do electrode placement, and that will show up, if, all, if at all, it'll show up on some following um, lab practical. Okay, very good.